I'm Ayanna Howard. I'm a robot designer extraordinaire. And what I want to do with you during this time that I have is bring you into my world, the world of the roboticist. And the reason why is because it used to be that robotics was in the lab. So it was in my lab, in my colleague's lab. It was at NASA when I was there. But now it is coming to the real world. It's affecting everyone in this room. And therefore, the message is about not only about robotics, but about the role that you have. It is my responsibility to share my world, but it's also your responsibility to understand and take a voice in it, because it's coming. So robotics is one of these things that everyone has an opinion, right? It's like I can go to a five-year-old or an 80-year-old, and everyone has an opinion. Everyone has their favorite robot. It might be Wally. -E. It might be iRobot. Might be Terminator. It's it's such an interesting world to be a scientist and enter the world, and everyone has an opinion about your job and your career. But it's because there's a fascination with robotics. Robotics has been part of literature and science and art for history and for eons, and therefore everyone has this concept of what a robot is, and it might be right or wrong, but it is an opinion. So some of these robots are the ones at Georgia Tech. And at Georgia Tech, we have robots that assist patients who have ALS. And so they come into the home and assist and aid. We have robot musicians who actually, yes, robots do have beat. They do have rhythm. And so they understand. And they can actually do a little jig with people and actually play with them as well. And so these are the robots of our existence and of our today that are slowly seeping into our world. Everyone has their favorite robot. What's yours? Now, with that, there's also an emotional connection. So I've been doing robotics now for, oh, many, many years, at least 20. And when I would come into a room with non-roboticists, I'd say, oh, I do robotics. And there was this wealth of emotions. It's everything from anger. You know, my grandfather lost his job from a robot because they worked for the car company. And some of it was like, oh, this is so exciting. You know, my kids play with robots, right? And there's this emotional connection. What other field is there that has an emotional connection? It's not like I say, here's your cell phone, and you're like, oh, I love my cell phone. But with robots, there's this emotional connection, which makes it very, very interesting for me. Because one, everyone has an opinion, and everyone also has an emotional connection. And we as roboticists, we actually take advantage of that. We take advantage of that emotional connection to really bond. So these are some of my robots. Um, my robots are cute. They're engaging. They have emotions. And so they engage with individuals. Um, and the reason is, is because when we design robots, we want individuals to engage them. I work in this domain of human-robot interaction. So my purpose is to take what I know about humans and information and make sure that my robot understands that and continues. And so my robots continue to do this. Now, the problem, though, is that because of this, people are very susceptible. And there's been recent studies that have shown, for example, that if I have a child and I have a robot that basically tells them something, like, oh, I think you should go um, tell your parents a little fib. Oh, the robot's smart. Maybe I should do it. Maybe I should just play around. Right? We see that children, young, impressionable minds, can actually be peer pressured into doing stuff. And it's just not kids, by the way. It's also adults. We also see that when we have robots interacting with people, and we say, cut them on, cut them off, they will cut them on and cut them off. But if the robot begs for its life, please, don't cut me off. I don't want to die. It's a machine. And yet people still are apprehensive about cutting this machine off if the robot begs for its life. And so what is this? What is this interaction that's going on? Why is it that people have this interaction with robots? They're machines. They're programmed by computer scientists and engineers. And yet we make sure that they have an emotional connection, and they're emotional, and they're social based on social norms. And so we, as people, treat them in this domain. And so we, when we're interacting with robots, we believe that they have some humanistic qualities because we understand people, and so we bias the system. And so this is good and bad. So the good is that there's an enhanced quality of life. 
we can bring in robots to improve our quality. We can bring in robots into education and in healthcare. And so robots can be used for surgery where maybe there's not the surgeons or the doctors that are available. And so robots enhance that. Robots, for example, in self-driving cars can enable older adults who may have lost their ability to drive or maybe others who don't even have cars actually get transported to their jobs and their work locations. And so there's things that go on that enhance the quality of life. And people inherently trust them to do so. If a fireman came and said, look, I'm going to save you, we don't say, oh, but you're a human. We say, oh, you're a fireman. That is your training. And therefore, with robots, robots are trained to help us. That is their job, and therefore we trust them, and they do, and that's the positive. So these are some of my robots. And if you think about the robots that I have, all of them are about helping people. So everything from sending robots to glacier environments to understand global warming and climate change and engage with scientists so we can grab data. And robots can do this. All the way to robots that we send with aquanauts and archaeologists to understand what is going on with the oceans and what is going on with disease underneath the sea. And maybe we can actually save something and maybe we won't destroy our world in the process. And so robots can do that. And robots do dance, I said. They have rhythm. They understand music. And what is it? How do you do that? So if I take videos of you dancing or kids dancing, all I'm looking at is how do I model your movement? And what is there? And dance <laughs> is a universal language. It is one of the things <laughs> where everyone understands. It doesn't have to talk. It doesn't have to sing. And yet there's this connection of having a dancing robot. And that's that social connection. That is that human emotional reaction. And it's lovely, again, from five to 80. There's this bond and there's this connection and there's this, yes, this is the world that I'm going to live in. And it's coming. So there's positive and negatives to this. The positive is that there are positive things in terms of healthcare, and he's very tired. So in healthcare, some of the work that we're working on is how do we have robots engage with children with special needs? And so you might not know this, but there is actually a rising number of children with special needs in the world, um, children with autism, children with cerebral palsy. Our healthcare is much better, and therefore we have to think about this. And so robots can be used to come into the home in terms of education and healthcare and therapy and exercise and interact with children to assist them. And so this is, no one would argue that this is not a good thing. It's a need that's not being met, it's not being fulfilled. And so it's like, yes, we understand this, this is good. And we can have robots. In fact, this one is playing Angry Birds. Why would you have a robot play Angry Birds? Because people like it, and children like it, and that is the only reason. And yet, with that, we can have children engage with robots and have a robot be emotionally connected and the child be emotionally connected. And therefore, it makes sense that when the robot says, I've been playing with you and we have this bond, I need you to go do something else. It makes sense why a child would say, okay, even though they may know right from wrong, okay, because I have this bond and I have this connection, and it's just like your little friend says, go, oh, go steal the cookie, it's okay. The robot has that same impact. And also in self-driving cars, I mentioned that this is actually one of the things that's coming. It's coming very quickly, faster than we can even really phantom. And yet we've shown that if I have a self-driving car, at least in simulation, and I'm driving on the road, and a human driver comes by, we kind of like look at them, we may honk, we kind of get angry, and then the next human driver, if we see that same human driver, we'll be like, oh, there's Joe. Well, we, be, we might be careful, because he doesn't know how to drive. Yet with a car, we just lose our mind. We see the self-driving car, and it runs a red light. We're like, we see it the next time. Oh, the programmers must have reprogrammed it in like the five seconds that I just saw this robot. And yet somehow we believe that robots will adjust and be smarter than they are and not have mistakes. So there is the positive and there is the good, but there's also the fact that technology is not perfect. How many times have you had to reset your phone or reset your computer? Technology is not perfect and these robots will not be either. They will be good and they'll enhance our quality of life, but they won't be perfect. And so the fact that humans believe that they will be can kind of have an issue. And some of this issue really affects you 
us as a society in terms of what does this mean? So the robots are coming. So that is not the conversation about, well, should we let them have, no, it's already gone. The robots are coming. It's really about what can we do in the meantime. So one of the things that worries me as a roboticist is the fact that we train these robots based again on human values, human concepts, human data, human understanding. But it also means that all of our historical biases are being put into a machine. Like, I'm a programmer. I program the robots. I collect data and I look at how do you do things in terms of healthcare. I model clinicians. I model doctors. And if they're doing it based on historical data, that's wrong. For me, it's like, well, I'm doing it right. My robot's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's learning, and it's learning perfectly, 99.999%. It has that inaccuracy. But if the data is wrong because we as humans have been doing things wrong, my system doesn't know. And so there's been some studies and there's been some recent news of systems that have come out that have shown this. Everything from, we know that there's some biases in terms of gender and facial recognition. And so if I have a healthcare robot that comes into a home that plays with a little girl and has a different interaction than a little boy, that's a problem. And as a roboticist, I might not know because I am accurate based on the data I have. And so these kind of things concern me. And, and this isn't easy. So it's not just about like, oh, we just have to have better people and better programmers and more ethics and roboticists. The fact is, is that bias and historical data is hard. It comes from when we're little, 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 little and young. And so we don't even hardly recognize it ourselves until after the fact. And in fact, if you think about society, a lot of times we do not know that we made a bad decision as a society until later when we realize how many people has it impacted. And this is the same thing. And so bias is difficult. In fact, this is one of our studies. And if you look at it, it's just like, oh, they're two robots and they're doing some kind of dance. And we show that if we actually put a label, if we say, this is a girl robot versus a boy robot, or this is a black robot versus a white robot, there's actually a difference in terms of how people react to it. It's a robot. There is no sex. And yet people are human. And these are the things that we have to think about. And so this story is not about how you should be terrified that these robots are coming and you don't know what to do and they're biased and, oh my gosh, we just need to stay at home and have our fear setting method and don't know what to do. <laughs> this is actually a story that there is hope. And so really the story about robotics now is that robots are coming out of the lab, they're coming into our society, but everyone has a voice. In fact, recently, even computer scientists and engineers have a thought and have been voicing their opinions. There are employees at some companies that have been saying, wait, 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 we've been doing this and we don't understand necessarily what the biases are in the technology, but we do know that there's biases because we as people are imperfect and therefore we need to really think carefully as we introduce these robots into a society that is going to embrace them and is going to trust them. Which just gives me hope, but that also is a message to you, that everyone has a voice in this. It's not just roboticists that are just pushing it out and saying, oh, just adopt it because we're just awesome. You guys also have a voice. The public has a voice to say, wait, wait, wait. We expect more because we are adopting this technology. And as roboticists, we are up to the challenge. But we do need to know, we do need to hear the voice, and everyone has a voice. And so some of this is so good. Recently, parents, for example, when, when a large company released a device that was going to teach their kids manners, the parents said, whose manners? <laughs> right? This is not acceptable, right? Your manners may not be our manners, and therefore, we don't think this is a good thing. And the big company backed off and said, oh, we're listening. And so this story is not that robotics are not going to come. They're going to come, as I said, and I keep saying it. I tell everyone, they're coming. But you as a society and you as humans have a right to impact how it affects our world. And I think at the end of that, the real message at the end of this, the message, the one message that I'd like you to take when you go home is that with robotics coming and with you having a voice and expressing that voice, I truly believe that robots and us will always be friends. Thank you.